Well, I'd like to welcome everybody. We got another episode of Crypt Ricks. I've been thinking, and I want to welcome all of you to my crypt. And this is where I love to be the most. I love to sit back, interview people, talk about different subjects. Got a whole lot of different subjects actually coming up in the future. I got some interviews planned and for on different topics. And just uh, really enjoy doing this. Uh, let me just check my mic, guys. There we go. And like, as I was just saying, I enjoy doing this and I enjoy talking and meeting new people and hearing their stories because I've always, uh, as I've always said, you know, everybody in my life, in, in my view has an interesting story. And why is the story interesting? Because it's your story and that's what makes it interesting to me and I'd love to hear it. But this uh, interview that I'm going to be bringing, I'm going to be talking about today is on a very sensitive subject. I've had a couple interviews already and talking about a case, the David Crowley case. You know, you may know him through the uh, trailer that he had. He was working on a project called The Gray State, which we was hoping to have as a movie down in the road. Uh, and basically, you know, his uh, whole, they're saying it's a murder-suicide. Some are saying that. Some are saying it's a plain-out murder. And there's definitely two sides, as I said in the other interviews, on this camp. There's the side that's saying that he is definitely innocent, and there's a lot of evidence to prove it. And that he, you know, at least enough to reasonably doubt that he's in, you know, not he didn't do this and he's innocent. And then you got the other side saying that, you know, the evidence is what it is and he's guilty. And I'm, I've am i said from the beginning, I want to hear both sides of this. And I will be getting people on from the side that thinks that he's guilty. And I think that's only fair. I've stated that from day one in all of my interviews that I do want to hear both sides of this case. I want to hear both parties and get their thoughts because I'm in the middle. I kind of see it both ways right now and I'm doing what everybody's told me to do. I'm actually going in and reading all the evidence myself saying, let me tell you, there's a lot of evidence to go through with this case. There's a lot of stuff to read and it takes a while to do it. So I just want to make sure that I get all the reading in and look at the case myself. I think that's only fair and that's what I'm, I'm doing currently right now is really digging into it. I want to read all the police reports, everything that they got. And I think that's a great way to approach it. Probably the only way to approach it is to read all this stuff for yourself. So that's where I'm at with it. I definitely uh, am looking forward to speaking to my guest. I'm going to bring her in and let her introduce herself. And then we're going to go ahead and talk about this case a little bit. How are you doing, Sophia? I want to welcome you to my crypt. I want to... Thank you for taking the time to come and talk to us about this case. As you know very well, it's a very sensitive case. There is definitely two pi two sides to this uh, case. And I just want to get uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and let me know what got you involved in this case. How did the, how did you get involved in this case from the very start? What brought you to it? Uh, well, uh, for the record, my real name is Julie, and uh, I just chose Sophia because I don't like to have my personal information on Facebook. And that is the only reason why I chose that. But um, ever since I've been involved in this case since uh, late December 2017, okay. when the um, documentary came out on Netflix. For, uh, I think it was called The Gray State or A Gray State. A Gray State, yeah, I know the one you're okay, talking about. I've watched you. it a few times myself. Mm -hmm. And when I was watching it, you know, I've, I've watched plenty of documentaries throughout my lifetime, and not once have I felt like I've been lied to. And that was really weird. It was awkward, uncomfortable, and just. At first, I was trying to give them the benefit of the doubt, thinking, okay, well, they're a family and they lost loved ones. and But it was the way that they were trying to manipulate the audience that really sent out the red flags for me. 
And by the end of it, I was like, I have to look into this case because I've just been lied to. Mm -hmm. And I went to the group that Dan and Greg had uh, talked about in their interview and stuff. And uh, I personally, I was uh, kind of narcissistic at that time thinking, oh, I probably know what happened. You know, just, I'm just going to do a little bit of digging and I can solve this in five minutes. <laughs> I, th I think, I think we all think that at first, I think we're all, we all, like, I'm going to look at a couple of videos and I'm going to have the whole, all the answers. And then you start to dig into it. And as yes. I was saying, there's a lot to this case there. It's um, especially when you start looking at the two sides the, the, of the people who are saying the one side saying he definitely did it. And then you got one side saying that he didn't do it. So when you start looking at all the evidence, it, it definitely is, um, it's overwhelming. That's the only way I ever put it. It's overwhelming when you start looking at all the different uh, files and the police report and the autopsy reports. Like, I thought it might only be a couple pages to read, and it's like, no. oh, it goes on forever. And uh, when I first joined, they only had like the 93 pages and the 400, the, the large police report and the redacted police report. That was it. Okay. Wow. So there, there's then, a lot more since then that's come out. Yes. Yes. And um, so it was easier for me to start to learn it. And one of the ways that I started to learn was and a good friend told me this by the way and i'm happy to give this tip out to all the other people who are starting this case is to print out the redacted police report the 93 pages because the bigger one will kill your printer yeah i found it, out about the scripts i printed out all three of his scripts and i actually had my computer my printer was smoking i'm not even joking the back <laughs> of it was smoking it was so big so yeah definitely take your advice and print out the one that's not going to blow up your printer yeah. And then what you do is you separate all the summaries by officer. So, because as you're reading it, one officer will write like his first summary of the day of the discovery, but then he has several other summaries throughout the police report. Just take every single one of them and separate them. And, you know, like picked all of, uh, uh, Detective Gummerts together and Detective Bones together and you know just do it that way I promise you it'll be so much easier to understand this case okay. and it, once you do that and you just read over everything you really start to memorize it and I mean I, I've been known for this where I'll, I'll remember something wrong and Greg or Catherine will correct me and I go back and I look at the reports to see exactly what it actually said so that I don't repeat the same thing again. Right. Well, well, yeah, because it is such a, there's so many files that I think everybody along the way is going to kind of miss, you know, mix things up in that. I think that's to be totally expected. I mean, I've even missed, uh, understood things and had to go back and read it. And why I, I like your advice about how to break it up into little piles. You know, I kind of like, wanted to read it all at once and you just can't there's too much so i've been taking a lot of time because that that's the advice that everybody keeps giving me from both sides i've heard it they're like you have to go and read the case yourself look at the evidence yourself and i'm like okay i'm going to take that challenge and i'm going to do it I, I that's only fair i'm going to look at the evidence and that's and you're saying the same thing look at the evidence and but just warn people it's a lot of evidence uh, that you got to go is. through and it's a lot of um i found a lot of um medical terminology that i just don't know I'm not a doctor, don't play one in real life and don't want to. <laughs> and I'm just, I don't know the medical terminology. So I found myself having to go on Google and type in certain words to figure out what they meant and what they were talking about because I just didn't understand the terminology. So you have to take the time to, if you're going to look at the evidence, it's going to take you a bit of time if you're going to go through it all. And that's a great point that you say, like break it up in small pieces, you know, by the investigators and stuff and then kind of have a look at it and go through it slowly so that's great advice i have to say thank you another thing is, is go ahead. We, yep. a lot of the new members they want to just jump in and try to absorb it all and that's extremely overwhelming I and agree. they I get agree. frustrated 
and they just, they're just like, it's too much. I can't do this. And you just take a little bit at a time, just learn, uh, read through it, try to understand it, ask questions. You don't have to ask in the group. You could always ask, um, I'm not an admin, but you could ask Greg, you could ask uh, Catherine, you could ask me, I'm in the group. I'm just not an admin and uh, we'll try to help you. I can show you screenshots of the report to, to prove what I'm saying, that kind of thing. Because a lot of times people are like, trust me, I know what I'm talking about and, but they don't back it up. Right. And right. that's extremely annoying to me. I want to show somebody, Hey, look, they're talking about this. And then I show them a screenshot of a crime scene photo or of the reports or the DNA and stuff like that to back up what I'm saying, because it's important that they learn the correct information because if you, this case just has so much stuff and so many layers and rabbit holes and it just, you could get lost. You can get and, lost. And that's the trick to this case is trying. And I fell victim to it too, to be very honest, is going through all these rabbit holes. And I had to pull, mm -hmm. my, I had to pull, I've, I've had to do this a couple of times in the case. I've had to actually step back for a day or two and oh, just, yeah. and just say to myself, like, Okay, I'm. I gotta stay in the middle. It's very hard to do that. I know people that are listening are probably saying it's not. It's easy to stay in the middle. It's not because, as I said, you got. You're you're hearing a lot from the pros and the cons of his guilt or innocence, and so then what I do is when I hear something like that, I go and I find it in the in the actual police reports in that because that's to be fair that's all I have to go by. I I can speculate all day. I can speculate till the cows come home on who did it, why they did it. But the fact is, I'm never going to know that. And nobody's going to know that unless somebody actually that, if this was a murder, comes out and actually says they did it or something like that. For me, I I, yeah. I don't know how they're going to like find new evidence because it's been so long. I think there's not even really much evidence to even really look at anymore or test or anything like that. I could be wrong. There might be samples still that they can test. I don't know. There but, are. Okay, so if there are, then yeah. Okay, so then we can kind of maybe do some more testing. And that's kind of like... Uh, a part of the case that's has me kind of flipping back and forth is like, there's a lot of things that I'm wondering why they didn't test it. And then there's some things I'm wondering why they did test it. And it kind of goes back and forth. Now, when you, uh, uh, when you first got involved, you're like, um, what was it that made you, I know the Netflix, you said the Netflix uh, documentary kind of led you down a, a path. And I, I felt that way too. I felt that it, it ended very, it was for me, the ending of the movie was very jarring that's the only yeah. way that I can kind of uh, put my words to it is how I felt. It was, it, it jarred me at the end and I was like, what are they trying to say here? Like I, I thought it was going to, I thought myself it was going to be more of a, they were going to show both sides of it and then let their viewer kind of make up their mind. But they, I could tell at least from my perspective, and this is just me that near, like as it went further into it, they were definitely trying to go down a certain path and then, the way they ended it, it was just very abrupt to me. And I was kind of disappointed in the documentary. I thought it was going to be something different. I've watched it three or four times. Uh, just to be fair, I thought, because you always miss stuff. Even if you watch it, you're going to miss something. Yeah. So I definitely, that's how I keep feeling every time I watch it. I'm just like, whoa, it's just very jarring. And so my question is, what when you started looking into this case, what are the things that made you want to lean to the side that David is innocent. Like there must be a few things that really stick out in your mind that you're like, this is what's really making me think that he did not do this. Well, uh, when the very first thing that had piqued my interest was the fact that my gut was saying I had been lied to. And that was, that was hard to, to, anyway, it was, it was a very strong feeling. Okay. And when I started reading the documents and I was listening to interviews and stuff like that, stories kept changing and it was details that were changing and the truth never changes. It is the same all the time. So why are the details changing and these people's stories that, you know, 
I don't want to start naming names because. Okay, that's cool. No, nope, I don't. I, I don't expect you to. I, I really don't. I, I just but, want, I want to keep it right on with the evidence that we're talking about and what led you to where you believe you're at now that he you yeah. definitely believe that he's innocent i mean i'm if i'm saying if i'm speaking out of line let me know because i don't want to speak for you but you do believe that from what you've researched in the year the lot of amount of time you put in you put a lot of research in that this is definitely not david doing this is that am i right when i say that or am i misunderstanding as of right now i am about 98 percent sure that david didn't do this okay but if DNA came back, like hardcore evidence came back and said, yes, he did. Like I'm talking about DNA that hasn't been tested yet. The ones that, uh, the blood drops that were in the kitchen, the passive blood drops. Uh, and that came back saying that it was him. Then I would probably start to believe that he was guilty. But some questions would have to be answered, like why was his body moved? Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking just his arms. I'm talking his whole body was moved. Okay. And uh, why didn't we find more of his DNA in these DNA tests? It should have his DNA should have been all over that house. He lived there. Right. No, I totally I agree with that, and I thought about that, but. And in, in what I'm trying to say is, like, I get that his DNA should be everywhere. Like, we live in our houses, our DNA should be everywhere. But I don't think that they're going to be testing, like, all random spots in the house. Oh, I mean, I'm no. like, so what are you, are you just saying that they didn't test enough of the crime scene? Is that what you're saying? Uh, they took, I have it right here. Um, they took, like, 47, 46 or 47 blood samples. Okay. But they only tested, I think. I think um, maybe 19 of them. Okay. Uh, okay. 20. They took 47 items or blood samples right. from the crime scene. 16 items were tested. 21 items were not tested. Okay. That's kind of strange to me. Significant. You yeah. Know, like, why would you not test all of it? And. Yeah, so that is, yeah, that's a good question. Why wouldn't they? I, I don't know. Like, I, I keep saying, because I, I, don't, I don't know about crime scenes. I'm not an investigator. But I would, mm -hmm. logic would tell me that if you're taking those samples, that they would test them all. But maybe they don't because they think that they've tested enough. I don't know what their thinking is. But it's kind of weird that they wouldn't test all of them. Because one of those samples could show that somebody else was there, correct? Like, if they were being yes. fair. Right. And there are couple samples that show that two to three other unknown DNA samples popped up in the results. Okay. And David and Kamel and Ronnie were all excluded from that. Okay. And these are so, samples, these are samples that they've taken and tested that they can, that there is yeah. another, there's other DNA in there that is not there confirmed. That it's not their DNA. Correct. Okay. Well, yeah. Okay. Okay. So that so I'm definitely, I'm about I have, to, wow. Yeah, I have questions about that too. So right, yeah. If, if we could, so if we could get answers, you know, then then maybe my mind could be changed. Right. But as of right now, I'm not going to blame somebody who can't defend themselves. No, I agree. I agree. That that that's fair. And I'm. I'm just trying to think of there's God, there's so much to this case that it's really, I'm trying mm -hmm. to keep it right in the, I'm trying to keep uh, trying to remember all the stuff I've read. I've read so much in the report so far and his journals and stuff like that. I think his journal, the one thing I find that um, uh, I, uh, people are saying is that David now I'm, this is my take from what I've read in the journals that the, that he didn't, he didn't have PTSD and he wasn't uh, like he wasn't, I could be wrong on that, but a lot of people are saying that, he, some people are saying he did have PTSD and he didn't have PTSD. And was he ever diagnosed with PTSD? Because the reason I'm asking is when I read the journals, you can tell that he's going through some stuff. I mean, that it's evident yeah. to me. Like he's not like he's something's going on with the man. I'm just being honest. Like he's definitely struggling with a few things in his life. 
And so was he ever diagnosed with PTSD that you know of, or did it go undiagnosed? As far as I know, he wasn't diagnosed. I'm not sure that we actually would know because of HIPAA. All right. Okay. But, but uh, he does admit that he does have PTSD in his journal, but it wasn't due to the war. It was due to him being held over in the military against his will. Right. I did. And see he it. makes that right. distinction. Distinction. Right. I remember so, in an interview, him. He, I remember an interview I saw on YouTube where he talks about that, or it might have been the movie. Mm -hmm. I think it was the movie on Netflix that he talks about how he was very upset that they illegally held him over, and so that mm -hmm. would that would cause PTSD. I think you know, I think anybody that's in his shoes, anybody that's in the military that's been in a war, is going to have a little some problems when they come back. I would think. I mean, my cat is doing everything here to knock. <laughs> Oh my God! Sorry, <laughs> Sophia. Can't stop. She's never been this bad. <laughs> All right, I don't even know what she's clicking. Oh, okay, hold on. Uh, hold on, there, Sophia. I apologize. There we go. You are being bad. Okay. Today. She's being a cutie, but she's being bad. Interrupting. She's never sat here, and she's chewing on my fingers as I'm talking to you. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I gotta keep a straight face, but it's starting to hurt. All righty. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, so no basically we were at talking about the PTSD. So definitely it wasn't, we don't know because of the, of medical, uh, you can't talk about people, like you can't get information on their medical, but he does talk, as you said, talk about in his journal. Maybe I haven't got to that part. Um, uh, but he does, does he mention in it that he's, he thinks he has uh, he, it? He mentions it a couple of times. I think once in April and then again, in either June or July, he explains what he meant by that. Oh, okay. And so he's like, I have PTSD, but it's not combat related. And then he, he talks about a kidnapping. And I'm like, wait a minute, what is he talking about? But then uh, Catherine told me, just keep reading, keep reading. And so I kept reading and that was like, oh, that makes sense. He was stop lost. Okay. And right. that's what he's referring to. Okay. No, so yeah. That, yeah, like that journal to me is a great for me, I think it's even a good place to start for people because it's definitely going to get you in the mindset of where he was at that mm -hmm. time. And it, to me, it's very evident in the journals I, I, uh, that he was, like I said earlier, he was going through some stuff definitely. And I think that's why he was even experimenting with uh, different drugs. Like he was smoking marijuana. He was smoking uh, or uh, he was taking mushrooms and stuff like that, which we all, I've done enough research to know that they are treating people with PTSD on micro doses of mushrooms and on, on psychedelics like that as, yes, a, yeah. as a treatment. And they're having great success with that. So I, I think he was in his own way trying to treat himself. And I, I believe so too, because even in the journal, he talks about that he did research on it. Right. Right. And a lot of reading. Right. So yeah, that makes sense. That's why I just, I think that, I mean, I find the way that they had the marijuana in the crime scene pictures, I find that kind of weird that he had it, the grinder out like that with his daughter around, if you want to believe that's yeah. how they had it. People are, like, making a big issue out of the uh, bong in the bathroom. And I, to me, I don't leave that. that uh, I know people that leave their bongs in the bathroom. I just, I mean, people leave their drug paraphernalia all over their house. And so, I mean, it's not a big deal to me that, the bongs in the bathroom I, that just could be where he was allowed to do it is is uh camilla might have said you know what i mean there's a fan in the bathroom i don't know but if you want to do your bong go in there so we don't smell it kind of thing i know a lot of people that do smoke marijuana in the bathroom because it has a fan is my point mm -hmm. <laughs> so but leaving the marijuana out like he did is kind of weird to me i've just i i use cbd for my my medical condition and i've never left it in a grinder like that i kind of grind up what i need and then the grinder's empty after that, and then that's how I kind of do it. But everybody's different, so I kind of found that weird. But what? So you don't really think that he was taking a, like? Is there? Does he mention? Does he? He's not doing a lot of drugs, from what you guys can tell, right? This was kind of just him experimenting. Yes, and he then talks about how he really didn't like the experience, and so he didn't do it again. Okay, so it wasn't something that he was doing all the time. Is like what you're saying is from what you can tell of the journals he wasn't correct all right no that makes and sense. the pot the pot he was talking about how at the end of the summer he was planning on quitting right and he really didn't like to do the drinking like 
the beers and stuff like that. He didn't like the pot as much and he didn't, he really didn't like the mushrooms. Right. I mean, yeah, I remember that. Yes. And so, what was he drinking though? Cause I did read in one of the report, uh, somebody, I, I, I've went to so many sources now. I don't even know where I'm getting them anymore. What he, what was he abs- drink? Absent, right? Yes. And what is that? Does that, I, I, I don't, I, I'm a recovering alcoholic myself. I've been sober almost 12 years now, maybe longer now. I can't remember, but what does it, is that um, like a hallucinogenic drink or does it have that pro- effect on people or do you know anything about that at all? I don't know if he was drinking the real absinthe or not, or if it was just kind of like a synthetic, I'm not sure. And personally, I, I don't really drink very often. So right. all I know is that it used to cause in, like in France, cause I was doing some research on it, okay. that it, it had caused um, these horrible hallucinations to where this guy went psychotic and killed his whole entire family. And then the United States had banned it. And the only place that you could get it was Louisiana at the time. I'm not sure if it's still legal throughout the United States or not, right. if they brought it back or what. Right. Yeah. Cause I, like I, I heard about it in like when I used to, uh, when I've done research about old, like in the olden days, you know, like medieval, like maybe not medieval, but you know, a long time ago I heard about people drinking this, but I didn't even know you could still buy it. So I found that really yeah. interesting. And I just wondering like, if he was drinking a lot of it or something, because that might explain some of the, cause there is a paranormal side to this. Cause it's right in the movie where you hear them talking about some of the instances that they had and things that they were seeing and hearing and stuff. So, I mean, I was just wondering like maybe that had something to do with it. I'm just thinking out loud kind of thing. One of the reasons why I never really put much stock into it was the fact that they hadn't uh, taken any photos of alcoholic beverages that were in the house okay and i think they were looking for anything to prove david guilty at that point they took photos of the pot right and so you're saying if there was a ton of mary if there was a ton of alcohol there or stuff like that they would have for sure taken photos of it yes i really truly believe it and i think that they would have also mentioned it in the police report i have received police reports from apple valley um, from other cases and they do discuss alcohol that's in the household and other drug paraphernalia that's in the household right and the only thing that they discussed for this case was the pot right and that was it right and then well the- i mean they did discuss mushrooms like because david mentioned it in his journal but right but they, they didn't, didn't find it exactly so yeah that makes sense and what about when they did the autopsy they didn't find any drugs in his system right there was no mushrooms there was no thc that they could test that they could tell or am i wrong on that um as far as we know his autopsy toxicology report that's attached to uh to the autopsy says that it was there was no drugs in the system and I'm pulling that up right now Okay. because there's a certain test that they did run that is extremely sensitive and the results can come back within 24 to 48 hours. Okay. And, uh, immuno, immuno assay tests. And it says that it was negative, no basic or neutral drugs present or on chrom- chromatology. And this specific test, it can pick up pot, it can pick up shrooms, it can pick up uh, heroin, meth, it could do all of that. Really? So you're sure um, that, like, you're sure that, that that test can do that? It can pick all of that? Yes. Wow. Okay. The Google search um, basically lists all the things that it can pick up. Wow. So they, they, uh, they, threw, they threw the gamut at his, at his blood work when they did the autopsy. Then they really wanted to test and make sure that there was nothing or there was something maybe or nothing in his system, but they definitely threw the gamut at it. Yes. And I did make a post in regards to this in the group. And um, this, I know some people are saying, well, they did the autopsy and they, this is just a summary they didn't attach the whole thing. That might be fair, but 
if he had drugs in his system, it would have been added to this autopsy before it was signed. And it was signed um, on 2-23-2015. And then again, it was signed on 3-22-2015. So that would have given them plenty of time to add anything else. Oh, for sure. That right. Have... Yeah. So no, that, so, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, if that test, if it says that when you, when you research it, that that test can cover it all, they're going to, it's going to, something's going to show up if he had drugs. I'm kind of surprised he had nothing in his system because then yeah. why, if like you can't, people can't have it both ways. He was either doing drugs or he wasn't doing drugs. And why would the poppy out the way they took the photograph of it? And he has no drugs in his system. That's kind of weird to me. Like, why would you have an open grinder of pot on your desk? with weed beside it and then insinuating obviously from the photo that they were smoking it, but none of them have it in their system. Kind of mm -hmm. weird. That's kind of weird to me. I mean, I don't, I don't know anybody that just leaves their pot ground up on their dresser like that. I've never seen that. So, I mean, that's kind of makes me wonder why they would even have, like, I'm sure they had to photograph it for evidence, but kind of weird that there's none in his system. I find, I've, I do find that very strange that the yeah. pot would be out like that, but there's nothing in it. And I, I truly was expecting to see that show up in his, on his autopsy report. Oh, for sure. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah, I was shocked when it when it wasn't. I was like, wow, like they made they took a photograph of the mar of the marijuana ground up and it looked like he was using it, but there's none in the system. It's kind of weird that it's not in mm -hmm. the system. And so, yeah, it's definitely one of those parts of the case that make you wonder what was going on. And that's the that's the frustrating part to this me for this case is that we're never gonna know what happened in that house like obviously something it doesn't matter who did it if david did it it was a very uh a great act of evil to me if if he did it and it was yeah. a great act of evil if somebody did it to him and that's the sad part is that a family that was very young was their lives were cut short and especially his little daughter like it's 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 a very upsetting case when you look at it and uh that's why i want to be fair to it i don't want to just uh jump the gun and and run with theories and stuff like that that i want to kind of i the only like as i said at the beginning i only have the evidence that I, they present to me that i can look at and that's what i'm looking at but i also have a lot like i said earlier i have a lot of questions too why they didn't do certain things now the one thing that i from the crime i looked at the crime scene photographs um and going back i can't believe i talked about dog crap this is horrible but it's part of the case so they did take a lot of pictures of, of, of the dog feces. And it, to me, it looked very solid. And you'll know why I'm going with this in a minute. You'll know where I'm going with this. Mm -hmm. But is there any photos for when you look at them? And maybe because I'm just looking at them from my eyes. And I want to get your opinion. Is there any feces in that house that's not solid, like that's runny or or like looks out of case? Or does it just look like normal dog feces, solid dog feces like? Because I didn't see anything. I didn't see anything that looked. I saw one picture that it kind of looked uh, a little moister than the other ones, but I didn't see anything that looked runny, like you know. And I and I'll explain why, because I know from having pets that as soon as you switch your animal's food, if you do it too abruptly, yes. I'm going to tell you right now. You're if you don't believe me and you have a pet, go and start giving them food that they've never had before, and then you get back to me and let me know the results because I can guarantee. <laughs> That they are going to be going runny, and I'm—I don't mean to be graphic about it, but it's just the truth. And I'm wondering if he Paleo is accused of because they do say that Paleo did a lot of scavenging on these bodies. Actually, he's blamed for a lot of it, of eating the mm -hmm. heads, eating the arms and the hands. Why is his feces not runny? Like, why is it? I—I like, I find that very strange. Only because I know if I change, if I, I had to change my cat's food through my vet very gradually like i mean over a like a few months because he said if you don't you're going to cause a lot of turmoil in the in their digestive tract so i had to do it gradually if he's normally mm -hmm. eating dry food which we see in the pictures that he was eating dry food and then you all of a sudden he's eating human flesh i would expect there to be explosions all over that house what do you think about that do you think i'm on to something like just that makes sense to you too i absolutely agree because we got a puppy a week ago and we've been switching his food over from the food that the breeder sent with him. Okay. And those first couple of days were pretty rough because that poop was 
gross. It was yeah, exactly. And I and yeah. like we said, we don't mean to be graphic here. We're, I know what we're talking about a gross subject, but it, it's important, and it mm-hmm. makes me wonder. And that's what I thought when I first saw the dog feces in the in the photos. I was like, well, I would expect there to be a lot more loose than it was. Yeah, and another point is is he's going like four times a day and he's not just doing one poop at a time he's doing like three or four different poops Mm -hmm. and you know and i'm like thinking back to the crime scene going okay there's not enough there right for the three weeks so and honestly i'm still on the fence on whether or not they were dead seven to ten days okay or and i i don't think that they were dead for three weeks though right yeah, and see, three weeks to me seems a long time too mm-hmm. uh just i mean i don't know anything about bodies when they when they pass away and if they when they start you know going through the process of decomposition and that but i do find three weeks i would expect it to be a little like i don't know see the problem a lot of people say there would be insects and there would be uh, insects starting on them and that. But I don't see, I don't know enough about crime scenes. And I don't know if the temperature, I know that there was the do- back door was open a crack and the temperature was set, I think, at 68 degrees. If I remember, I'm close to that. I think it was 68, I think. Yes. So did, did anyone in your group do any research on if um, mosquito, like if, and like I would expect that there would be flies or stuff, but a lot of people are saying it's too cold for that. Have you, did you guys look into that at all? When I first came to the group, that was one of my initial questions is like, where are the flies and the maggots? Why aren't the police discussing this? And I was told from Dan Hennen in the very, very beginning that it was too cold for the flies. Okay. And they don't have them in the winter time in Minnesota, which is different because I grew up in Texas. So, you know, we have flies all the time right right and uh so that for me that was a learning experience now i do understand other people still have that question and they still think that there could you know there should be flies and other things there um but you know everybody has their own opinion and right i just you think that it was you think it was too cold for there to be flies Is, is that what you're saying I think that it was too cold to have blowflies and the maggots. My thing is, is there was fruit out on the counter and fruit naturally has like these little larvae eggs that come in it when they're shipped and everything. Mm -hmm. Why weren't there fruit flies at least? It was starting to age and get gross and stuff. That's my own thing because Makes sense. Yeah. they're not coming from outside. It, it, they would have came on that product. Right. And that's the only thing that I have uh, a question about, but it's just kind of minor at this right. point. Yeah. <laughs> like that's the thing too. Like I've, like I've had people ask me like, well, why is there no maggots or flies? They should be covered in it. I'm like, well, a, the temperature from what they said i think yeah. it was 68 degrees and please don't light me up guys if i'm wrong on the temperature but i think it was 68 degrees it was yeah okay mm-hmm. that's good so you know, i'm retaining some of this and that's the part that i like i don't know i just don't know enough i'm not a medical examiner i don't know what is supposed to happen to a body or within uh, three weeks two days 10 days i don't know so i go by what they say and i have to assume that i would assume it was too cold for that but you make a good point with the fruit on the on the counter and stuff like that you think that there would have been uh some flies starting with that or i mean it's really yeah that's a good point like it it's another part that you can ask and you know it's just another one of those questions that i kind of have and it's a good question why when there are no fruit flies sure I'm with you. I'm with you on that one. I can see that one. Now, I want to go to the door that was a jar at the back of the house. Okay. Yes. Did they know how, mm-hmm. how how far was that open? Was that open? Like, is it an inch? Was it minuscule? It was like a quarter of an inch. Okay. So not very and, much then. Yes, but it wasn't locked. Right. Well, that's and, yeah. See, a lot of people in the case say that there was 
he couldn't have been murdered because there was no forced entry. And I'm like, that mm -hmm. you're kind of can't like that. Not every murder has a forced entry. If the door, back door was open and they could get in, it's not going to be called forced entry. It's going to be entry, but it's not forced entry because the door was open. So I, I kind of, that's where I am on that one. Like a lot of people are saying, well, there was no signs of forced entry. So it was David. And I'm like, wait a minute. That's you're right in the fact that there's no forced entry, but there could have been entry because the door was open at the back. So, correct. you know, mm -hmm. what do you think? Do you think I'm right on saying that? Or like to me, that oh, just, yes. yeah. Like, so that's another question I've had about the case too, is that door open a little bit. And I've always wondered why the dog wouldn't have opened the door more. I'm sure he could have, I've seen dogs take a door and a patio door and nuzzle it open with their nose and their body. It kind of makes me wonder why he wouldn't have done that or, but it's another, again, it's speculation, right? I, I'm not a dog. So, you know, but I don't what, understand that one either. Right. Honestly. Yeah. You know, and he I, didn't do a lot. Uh, he didn't do a lot of things that I would have expected. He didn't destroy the dog food bags that were sitting there right off the side of the kitchen. Right. He didn't try to go outside. Um, he didn't knock things over in front of that big window that um, the neighbors looked through when they discovered the bodies. Right. And personally, if he was going crazy and attacking the window and trying to get their attention and barking a lot of those knickknacks on those on the metal bookcases would have been knocked over right right and, and is, that, is that what they were saying when they when they went to the house yes. was that dog acting like was he upset basically i'm not sure how to word it like upset angry yes. trying to get attention and stuff like that so yeah that would make sense if there was nothing knocked over in a way and i also wonder how nobody hurt like you think somebody would have heard him if he was there for three weeks yeah. by himself i kind of i find that strange too and it's just my thoughts why would he not be barking would he not be howling because i know my neighbors they got two dogs and if my neighbors are gone for more than like say four or five hours the dogs start getting yippy over there like they start getting a little vocal and I know every mm -hmm. dog, I know every dog's different. I know that people say, you know, I'm not saying that all dogs do that, but I'm just saying I kind of three weeks with nobody around him, I would think he'd be howling and crying and barking and making a little bit more noise. It sounds like yeah, it's pretty quiet absolutely. over there. Wow. See that? So, yeah. Go ahead. I mean, it, it's just crazy because he didn't destroy uh, shoes. And I know that our puppy grabs every shoe in this house and <laughs> like right now he's chewing on my flip-flop <laughs> and uh you know it's just i don't understand he should have destroyed a lot more in that household um there was oh there was this blue uh tube right by the window next to those uh uh bookcases okay and it was like some type of a yoga tube or yoga mat rolled up and in the police photos, you see it standing up when they come into the house. And then I guess one of them brushed by it, mm -hmm. one of the police officers, and it's on the ground. Well, how did Paleo knock that over? Or how did he not knock it over in three weeks? Right, right. And especially in that frenzy when he sees somebody and he's getting their attention and running around in circles and stuff like that. How did he not knock that over? Right, right. No, no, I can, yeah, like, the, and yeah, it's kind of like, that's, a, it's a frustrating case because you have the, you have a lot of questions and there's no way to answer them. And I don't, I, I definitely trying to stay in the middle and on track because I want to keep with the evidence. But as we're going through, there is some things that are very strange. Like, why didn't they test all the blood samples? And mm -hmm. now this is one thing I, I'm trying to figure out by looking at the autopsies report. And now I'm talking about the bullet that they found a month later in the roof. Okay. Yes. Now when mm -hmm. David was found, he was found on his back, correct? Arms correct. extended. Okay. Now from where, like, I know you know the picture a lot better than I do because you spent years looking at it. Now where he was lying was the bullet kind of follow me on this was the bullet forward of him in front of the door or was it like where was it played like if, when he was on his back where was the bullet to his body was it in front of him over the door behind him to the side behind him and to the to the left up i think okay so Catherine it was can explain it more okay so and 
the bullet, okay, I'm dyslexic and I'm looking at myself in this thing, so it's it's hard for me. Okay. I'm just gonna say it's on his left side. He's laying towards the window and the bookcases mm -hmm. right there. Mm -hmm. And the gun is on his left side too. Mm -hmm. The bullet exit was on his left side. Yes. So why didn't it go through the window? Why didn't it go into the wall? Right. Why so, did it go that way? Right. So and into the ceiling. Right. So you, it's kind of like, I find that kind of weird too that, and I do, I've seen, um, I'm trying to think of all the ways like, and I definitely could see uh, somebody putting the gun in their mouth and holding it. Like, you know, a lot of people, like I'm trying to look at this very, as I keep saying, down the middle. So I'm being fair to myself and into this case. I really believe that. And I'm, I'm hoping I'm sticking to that. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking a lot of people are saying, well, he was right-handed. How did the gun end up on his left side? And I'm thinking if he's holding the gun with both hands and I, I'm trying, I'm assuming he was aiming it in his mouth or I don't know, like, don't quote me on this. I'm not saying this is how he did it, but I'm assuming that from the from the what they're saying, they didn't find any uh, on the right side where he would have shot himself. They didn't find an entry wound, so I'm assuming it was probably through the mouth or somewhere along that angle. And so I could see the gun going to the left because it, once you shoot yourself, I could see the arms kind of doing that. I'm just being honest. I could see the gun shooting and oh. then dropping. What do you think? He's holding the gun with his right hand right. and pulling the trigger. He's holding probably the gun with his left hand to brace. Okay. He shoots himself. He goes limp. The gun's still in his right hand. Okay. But were that were to be fair, now he could, we don't know that he did have it in his right hand and do it that way. He could have been holding it with his right hand and had his trigger on the left hand. He could have been holding the gun with his left hand, trigger finger with his right finger. You see what every, I'm saying? Every photo that I've seen of him shooting, it's always been right hand, left brace. Okay, okay. So, okay, fair enough. I'm just, like I said, I'm trying to look at it every way. But, so. of course, I mean, it could have changed at that very last moment. He could have been nervous. Right. He could have injured his right hand. Right, right. And decided, I mean, let's play devil's advocate and say that that's what happened. It's it still doesn't explain how the bullet got that way and not yes, that, to the left. Yes, I find that weird too, that if it, because I did read the autopsy report and they're saying that in it was kind of um, in the middle on the right. I'm, I'm, now I'm getting dyslexic looking at myself in my monitor too. <laughs> so, came out the left side, right? Yes, right side, right. So it came out his left side, kind of on an angle like this. Uh, so people can see. So it came out like an angle, like kind of like that. So why, how would it end up behind him over that way? Yeah. Like, I find that kind of weird. I would expect it to be going the other way, like kind of following through and either going in the floor towards the window or up in the, the wall kind of area. And if he was shooting with his left hand, because there's nothing saying that he put, he put it in his mouth or underneath his chin. Right. We there's don't nothing know. Right. stating that at all. But if he was shooting it and with his left hand and he put it up to his left side of his head, why is the exit on the left side? Right, right, yeah. No, I get, no, I get, no, I, I told, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. I Maybe I explained mm -hmm. myself wrong. Like, I, I definitely agree that it came out the left side. I'm just, and I agree that it was probably, we don't know if it was in his mouth, under his chin, whatever, we don't know. But I do find, like, I totally am on board with you that I find kind of how they ended up, they're saying it ended up in the ceiling. And I, yeah. and I still find it very suspicious, and I don't care who gets mad at me for saying it, that they found it a month later. That, yes. to me, is a major red flag. And, I, and you can try to say that that's not a red flag, but it is. Because think of all, they found all of this evidence in the house, and they, were, they must have looked at every inch of that crime scene. And how do you miss a bullet hole in the ceiling, and then when somebody comes back a month later, they notice it right away? To me, that says a lot. Like, I mean, you're telling me that all the police and all the medical examiners and all that, nobody noticed this hole in the ceiling, which I think they And the crime know. scene cleaners. Exactly. The crime scene cleaners should have noticed it and patched it up. Exactly. That, and that's that's something that is a part of the case that makes you question it. And, and it's a month later. I find that very strange. And then another part of the case that I, I, I wanted, and I'm going to ask the other side this when I interview them, is that how did they explain, like, I mean, I find it weird that there was a bullet in the floor. 
if he just shot himself yes. if he shot us if they're saying that it's going by what the police say that he shot him, his uh wife which i find twice in the head i find that kind of odd why would you do that then shot his daughter and then himself why was there a bullet in shot into the floor that's kind of strange to me i just i don't see why there would be one in the floor what do you think do you think no. that's kind of strange too i think it's incredibly strange and what I think is even stranger is the three bullets that they found that day on the carpet, mm -hmm. the spent bullets, mm -hmm. all had Camille's blood on it. It didn't have Ronnie's. It didn't have David's. It was all Camille's. And these are individual spent rounds. Okay. So and he so was shot. Uh, the autopsy report says only two times, but she was missing a lot of her head. Right. She was right. missing her hands. So who's to say that she didn't get shot once in her hands when she lifted up her hands to right. maybe brace herself? Right. And was I mean, there any, I know that they said that there was some trace DNA on the bullet in the ceiling, right? It did have David's, Yeah. Um, uh, not blood or tissue, but it had like finger, it could be finger, it could be some type of DNA passed that way. Am I correct on that? It, there was some type of DNA, but that bullet, it didn't test positive for blood. Right, or tissue so, or anything else. There was no hair, no tissue, no blood. Very strange. Mm -hmm. You think if it went that through his head, <laughs> there would and be something. They had taken several samples of that bullet, and only one sample came back. And it wasn't even a big bullet sample. You know, it, it was just, it was pretty clean looking. So. Right, it was. It was. And now, was there any bullets that had Rania's DNA on it? Yes. And, uh, so they did find a bullet that had her DNA on it that they can, they know that that's what killed her, that bullet. Yes. Um, item 53. I can't believe you guys was, know the items so quick. That's amazing. <laughs> like you guys just, <laughs> everything, I, everything, I, I know everything I ask you guys are like, oh, item four, item, I'm like, I don't know how you remember all this. Item 53 it had mixture of two or more individuals. Major DNA profile was Ronnie. Okay. Uh, major profile does not match David or Camille. That's... David and Camille were excluded from the contributors to the mixture. So who were the other two individuals? Okay, that's I gotta I'm gonna read that when I get off this interview with you, actually. So that is that in Ronnie's autopsy report? No, that is in the DNA uh, lab results. Okay, so I know where to and check. That's located in the group. It's also located on Greg's website. Okay, perfect. So if I look under the DNA uh, uh, results and the testing, it'll show it in there. That's where I can go look yes, for sir. it. Wow, so they're saying, so they there is Ronya's blood, but there is also two other DNA profiles that are hit on with that test of that bullet. Right. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's very strange too. Then what are they doing there? Like they shouldn't be there. Like that's okay. Wow. <laughs> I didn't see. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I just, I'm, I'm wondering why they're not, why the police didn't look into that further. I mean, I'm, if there's, there should just be hers, I would assume. And if at best there should be David's on it too, I would assume, but why would there, they, they were excluded, correct? Him and Cabela were excluded from those. Yes. Oh. They were excluded. Okay. Well, there you go. So it, yeah, it's it's extremely weird. I mean, there's like so many different red flags and oh my gosh, the rabbit holes for this case is mm -hmm. crazy. And right. you could get lost for weeks down these rabbit holes. Oh, exactly. So, yeah, and it's tr and that's true and it and like I, that's why I keep referring back to the evidence. That's what I can go with and and even the like I don't have to go into rabbit holes to make this case kind of weird I just have to look at the evidence and there's a certain things that are hard to explain and mm -hmm. I wonder why they didn't test the dog feces I mean if he's responsible for doing the amount of damage that they're they are claiming that he did as an investigator that would be something I would test I'm just saying for myself I'm not speaking for what other people would do but I would test it because that's a major part to me like that's a big deal that he ate these parts of the body there should be, I would test it. And I do know that they can test the dog feces and find out if there's DNA in it or bone fragments and stuff like that. They're done it in other cases. So mm -hmm. I'm very, find that very suspicious why they didn't test that. And, you know, is that where, do you find that strange too, that they never tested the dog feces or anything? Yes, I, I do find it strange. And 
I mean, for the fact that they were blaming him for so much damage to the bodies and the crime scene. I mean, I guess for anybody just looking at this case and not really putting much thought into the case, they could say, well, he was the only dog there. So of course he ate the bodies. Mm -hmm. But you look at that dog poop in the photos, you don't see bone shards in there. You don't, yeah, you do see hair, but Mm -hmm. he had destroyed toys and I mean, he could have eaten hair. I mean, I know the puppy eats my hair when he's trying to, And if he was scavenging on the bodies, I mean, and he was eating pieces of the skull and that, like from what they're saying, there would be hair on it. So that, yeah, I'm I'm not disputing that the dog didn't do any scavenging because at first I thought that it was all, there wasn't much evidence to the scavenging thing. And then I actually went and I read looking at the autopsy reports because, and I was wrong on that. I can admit that. I thought that there was no scavenging signs on on the bodies, but there is. It says it right in the autopsy that there was signs of scavenging. So yeah. the fact that he ate some hair, I can totally buy that. Like, I'm not saying the dog didn't eat anything. I totally believe he did. And and there, I think there is some evidence that he did. Well, there is, because it's in the autopsy that there was signs of scavenging. But signs of scavenging and eating everything that they say he ate is two different things to me, which is why I want to talk to the vet to find out if anything, if a dog ate, if he thinks a dog could do that. That's the question I want to ask him, is if a dog, he thinks a dog could do that. And... Would the dog have any lasting internal problems if he was eating bone like that? And would it not be like very evident in the stool samples and stuff like that? I just really uh, want to see uh, get a vet's point of view that's worked with animals his whole life. If that is, if it's normal for them to eat that much, like to me, it seems like he ate a lot if they're blaming it all on the dog. And would he also be eating on a body that is been that's been decaying for numerous days mm-hmm. when there's bags of dog food also in that house. Right. Would I'll he ask him. choose yep. the body or would he choose the dog food at that time? Because it's spoiled at that. Right. I hate to discuss it like that. That's, I know, but it's, it's so true. Incentive. It's true. And, and I do find it weird that he didn't pack, like, okay, he could have ate this some of the body. I get that. But the fact that he didn't upset his dog food at all, for three yeah. weeks like he never went and tipped over a bag he never scratched out a bag and stuff like that i know if i like i feed my cats twice a day and i know if i'm a little like an hour or two late feeding them they're, yes they're scratching at their their cat food bag they just are and that's just being truthful so i'm finding it strange that after three weeks he would never have disturbed those two bags of food it's possible it's possible he didn't i mean that's I'm, I'm, I, I, I'll go either way on that one. I'll give it to either side that, that they definitely, he may not have done that, but I kind of find it weird that he didn't disturb his food at all. And I'm also wondering where was he getting water from? Can you clarify that? Because I've had some people say that the toilet was full and that the dog, like he was getting water from the toilet and stuff like that. From what I can tell of the crime scene photos that I've seen is that I see the one toilet that's open. And it's got like paper towel. I don't quite sure know what's floating in there. Um, Mm -hmm. was that where they're saying he was drinking out of, or is there another bathroom or do you know anything about where he'd be getting his water from? He might've got some water from the basement toilet. I can't remember if it was up or down. And so I'll have to check that too. uh, I, you know, I don't mind being corrected on that one. Some people say that he was drinking water off of the bodies, you know, from the blood and stuff, getting his fluids from there but blood doesn't flow after a certain amount of time it congeals right i'll definitely ask the vet that too that's a great question yes a dog can a dog sustain itself eating drinking very little water because if he was drinking out of the toilet it would have been very little because the only way that that bowl like if he drank that's the thing that i always say is that if the water that's in your toilet if he drank all of that he would have to flush the toilet again to fill it up it doesn't just fill up automatically. You've got to actually flush the toilet to make the tank fill up the bowl again. So I'm going to ask the vet that if it's possible for the dog to survive for three weeks, drinking very little water and then living off of a human body, like the blood and stuff like that. It's a good question. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I don't know much about dog scavenging and what a dog really could do in that situation i know that 
our puppy drinks a lot of water, mm-hmm. a lot. I'm constantly refilling his bowl and cleaning it out and everything. So I just, I don't know. I, I don't think have the so answer. Too. Yeah, I would think they'd be drinking a lot of water, too, because of the time of year. I would imagine, I don't know about Minnesota if it's dry, but I know where I live in the winter, it gets very dry, and you're always drinking water. Like, I, at least I am. I, I'm very, I find I'm in the winter, I get very dry because of the air, so I'm constantly drinking more than I normally do. I just always notice that in the winter in my house, I drink a lot more water. So I'm kind of curious if it's, you know, you think you'd be needing more water than is in the crime scene. It's just, that's just the way I look at it. So another one of those questions, don't you agree? That makes you guys yes. that we'll never be able to answer, but it's something that makes you wonder. Like, was that dog really there for three weeks? And I, I don't know. I mean, I just, I, I, it's kind of hard for me to believe that he was there for the full three weeks. I just, I, I'm with you, Rick. I, I truly believe that he was not there the whole entire time. And you see his photo when he's being picked up at the, the vet's office or animal control. Mm-hmm. It, I'm not exactly sure what it yeah, was. Yes, the photo where he's kind of like in the cage and they're looking down at he, him. He doesn't look filthy. He doesn't look starved. He looks scared mm-hmm. and confused. And that kind of breaks my heart when I look at that photo. And, uh, oh, Sorry. There you go. See, that's okay. <laughs> now yours made an appearance. That I, I saw that one of your other videos. This one, the beautiful cat, by the way. Thank you. She's a British short hair. <laughs> She's just once on camera. <laughs> I know. It's animals. They, cats seem to love cameras when you turn them on. It's really weird. They do. They really yeah. do. But no, so yeah, I, I, I definitely think that we're all, like, the, I'm with you on the dog thing. I find it a little bit hard to believe he was there for the three weeks and nobody heard him. Nobody heard barking. Nobody heard uh, uh, anything going on there. But see, then I also I looked at the case from the side of, say, a lot of people are saying that they believe that David or maybe some of his fan, uh, Camilla or the daughter, was not murdered there and they were brought there afterwards or the dog was taken away and brought back afterwards. And the problem yeah. I have with that is that's a lot to try to hide if you're bringing bodies in and out of a house. Um without getting noticed and that's that's just being truthful to where i'm looking at it from that's a lot to to me i would think that it's kind of hard to be moving bodies in and out and dogs in and out and nobody's noticing anything so that's always the problem i've had with them not being murdered in the house and some people are saying maybe that they were taken out of the house or somebody was what are your thoughts on that do you think they were do what is your belief and be truthfully honest uh, be truthful. Do you think that they were murdered in the house or do you think that they were mur- somebody may have been murdered outside of the house? Or you have no way of knowing? I really can't make an absolute decision on that because not all of the blood was tested. Okay. Uh, not all the samples were DNA tested. Now, if, it, if they were DNA tested and it came back to show that Ronnie's blood was also mixed in there mm-hmm. and David's blood was also mixed in there, then I can definitely say, yeah, they were killed there. Mm-hmm. That, that totally makes sense. But everything that was tested came back as Camel's. Well, which is strange. You know, it is strange. Yeah. yeah. And it, it is, it's crazy because they were shot their blood should be there but all that blood on the the wooden floor behind like going around the right the that little yes was not tested they they took samples but they didn't test it and you think that they would i don't i can't figure out why they wouldn't test them especially I, if the blood's on the because that would answer a lot if that whatever's in that blood that's around that uh kitchen area going mm-hmm. it would that would explain a lot that would give if it's just david's that tells you one story, but if it's got a mixture of everybody's or it's somebody, it could be like, what if it's Kamel's blood? What if it's Rania's blood? That yeah. would be, that would be a whole different thing. Right. And if, if it's David's, that's another scenario. So why not test it to eliminate all those possibilities? And I don't have an answer for that. Right. Yeah. It's just very strange why they wouldn't do that. Now, what are your thoughts on a lot of people are saying that he was in a dark place and that, that's what caused him to snap 
because I've heard the two theories that he snapped and he did this, and then I heard the theory that they had a pact and that they did this. What are your stances on those two topics? What, do you, what are your thoughts? I don't think that there's proof of a pact. Okay. Um, if there was, the police would have written that in their police report. Um, I don't think David snapped. I think that he struggled and had some things going on in his life that yeah. I think that he really did struggle and, you know, I didn't want to believe it at first, but after reading the journal, it, it's, it's there. He struggled with being a parent. He mm -hmm. struggled being him yep. and he always wanted to work on improving himself. Now, if, I just don't see that in somebody who is a narcissist, who is a psycho, like some people call him. Mm -hmm. Why would why would somebody who's a narcissist or a psycho want to work on themselves? Right. They think that they're perfect as they are. Right. Well, they think and, every, everybody else is the problem and they're perfect. Like I, that's how they think. Yes. So uh, yeah, I totally see that, and you can, and it's true. Like anybody that's listening to this, if you haven't read the journals, please read the day one journals because it's going to give you a, a definite look into what David's uh, psyche was at, what he was dealing with. And it's very, you just got to read it. And that's what I've been doing. And it kind of answers a lot of questions because like, as I was saying to you earlier, a lot of people are saying that he had PTSD. Some are saying that he didn't have PTSD. Some are saying he snapped and the journal kind of, uh, you can definitely, as you, I agree with you, you can see he's struggling and he's trying to, uh, in my eyes, treat himself by trying some different, uh, drugs and stuff like that to see if he could treat it so i definitely think he was dealing with something but is it enough mm -hmm. to say that he snapped and i don't see anything in the journal that would point me to leading that he was on his way to snapping and murdering his family i don't see that in the journal yeah i don't see it either and there were parts in the journal where and i know that some people who were uh believe that david is guilty they also believe that he didn't like his daughter mm -hmm. and that he regretted well, he did, that. He did refer to her in a couple crude yeah, ways. Yeah, he did. You know, let's be and honest. Let's be honest. He did. I, I read that and I was like, okay, so there, he was, he did say a couple of little crude things. So that's being, let's be fair. And, you know, I explained this in a different uh, YouTube video where my um, grandson was switching medications because he's ADHD, ADD, and autistic. Right. And he was switching medications two weekends ago. And I swear to you, he drove me insane. He drove his mother insane. We, we were all exhausted and just annoyed with him, but it wasn't his fault. Mm -hmm. It truly wasn't his fault, but by the end of the day, I was just venting and saying, you know, he's such a little shit and stuff like that. And, and I did not like myself for saying that mm -hmm. I felt so bad. And I, it, it's, I felt guilty about it. And I can't imagine how David had felt. He is working from home. He's under stress, trying to get these scripts done. His daughter was there a lot. He was a single, well, not single dad, but he was a stay at home dad with her. Correct. And he's doing work with, um, was it, uh, he was doing work with some type of video production company. Okay. Okay. Um, I think it was like mortal code or something like that. Okay. And, um, so he's doing that. Camille's off at her job and he's trying to write also. And maybe Ronnie was just bored or tired or just doing one of her four-year-old things because at that time she was four and he just got frustrated with her and he wrote in his journal. And right. then later that night he felt bad and 
Yeah. We don't we don't know what led up to it. We don't know what happened afterwards. We just know what he wrote in the journal. Right. Yeah, he doesn't time. he doesn't really explain why he was feeling that way. He just explains that he felt that way. And that's all we get from the journal. So I, I see what you're saying. And, and I understand what you're saying, too, about being frustrated, because I, if you ask any parent, if they're being 100 percent honest, you're not going to tell me that at some point when you're a parent, you're not frustrated with your child. And you're like, oh, my God, you little shit, you know, you're driving me crazy and all of that. I mean, my parents used to say that to me when I was being a brat and I was driving yeah. them crazy. I was doing things to them and I was running around and they were trying to do cook dinner. Or they were trying to clean the house. It doesn't mean that you mean it. I mean, like, let's let's be fair. I mean, you can't. It doesn't mean that he didn't love his daughter or that he wasn't uh, that he was uh, not wanting to have her or stuff like that. I think he was struggling with being a father. And I and now the way that you kind of put it, like he was his wife was at work. And I never thought of it that way, that he was probably as basically a stay at home dad because she was working so much. And mm -hmm. then he's trying to write a script. He's trying to do other things. He's trying to be a father. He's try So, I mean, he's got a lot on his plate. And I don't, like, I mean, yeah, I totally agree that he did say some crude things in his journal. I'm, I'll never dispute that. It's right in the journal. Yeah. But I don't think it's uh, it's a sign of that he didn't want his daughter or anything like that. I kind of agree with you. And that's the way I took it is that he was just frustrated uh, at times. Yeah. And he just wrote it down. He Like, no, he, see, I got to keep bringing myself back to remember that he didn't expect any of us to be reading this journal. This was not ever meant to be seen by anybody but him and his family and his wife's and probably not even them. I think he probably wanted it just for himself. So you're talking about somebody pouring out raw emotions in these journals that nobody was ever meant to read. And I can only go by what I've seen, how he interacted with his, with his daughter. And that's in the documentary. They show some clips of him acting with his daughter. And I've seen some other videos on other, uh, places on the internet and he didn't he looked like a very loving father to me what do you think i mean yeah. I, that's what i saw like i saw him having fun with his daughter i saw him talking to her i saw him playing with her and you know so what do you think i think that he was a loving father that he was attentive i think that he at times was human also and could get pro uh, pushed and frustrated mm -hmm. like anyone can yeah yeah. And, you know, eventually she did go into daycare. Uh, first, it was a home daycare. And then it was the, the monastery school. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's great for her age <laughs> because oh, right. she was extremely bright mm -hmm. from what I could see in the videos and stuff like that. And she really needed to have other kids to keep her occupied and and use that mind of hers so right yeah no i like the journals that's why i keep uh, telling people to refer them back to reading the journals because it's going to give you a mm -hmm. kind of a base look into what was going on now i've also had i've heard people debating whether and i'm not sure if you can clarify this or not if you can't that's totally fine because i just want some clarification i've had heard some people say that he did he was it was a go for the script and he had he was getting 30 million dollars and it was he wanted to move to california and then i heard other people say that there was no deal and that he sent um a text to his father saying that he walked away from the deal like it, it wasn't what he wanted i can't remember don't i'm not i'm kind of paraphrasing i can't remember word for word but it was all on the gist that it wasn't right for in his heart or something i think he said so what do you know if he had it was there a deal or was there just a in the making was it in the talks what do you know about that part he discusses in the journal that he wanted to continue to he he wanted to do the tv series the limited tv series right. is what i think he was that they were talking about and he was excited about that now the journal does end before that date, uh, I think it was like November 10th or something when he was supposed to have sent that text to his dad. And it's not included in the police reports from his messenger uh, off of Facebook. Um, the the uh, phone records that we received from Apple Valley does not have any text messages going to his dad at all on that day or around that day. 
So as far as I know, with the information that I have, he did not send that text. Really? So then there's no hard, like you, there's no hard like piece of paper you can show me and say, this is where the text is. And this is mm -hmm. where, and it's not in the report of the police. It's not. Uh, so where is that coming oh. from? Is that in his journal or is that not even in his journal? Like, where's that no. coming from? It is in the police reports only because Dan Sr. and Dan Jr. wrote like a timeline in it's in that timeline. Okay. But there's no proof of it other than what they wrote. Okay. I and see. that's it. Wow. Okay. So then, so basically that like, so it was in the kind of the works of him getting a series. Cause I do remember that too, that the, the mics, I think they were, I'm not sure if that was them who were talking about it being a series, but they were kind of yes. saying that mm -hmm. it was too big of a subject to have in like a two hour movie that they wanted to break it up into a series. So I do remember mm -hmm. that. I do remember that being talked about. So I was just kind of curious if there was like, there was no, there was no money exchanged or, contracts no. or anything it was still in the discussion uh phase. the contracts yeah the contracts were still being worked on and okay. the contract is actually i think no there is a bill from the attorney that's in uh that paper bag that was on the front step and so they were still in, in negotiations and stuff i don't think he was going to sign anything until they accepted a script okay and he had been tweaking the scripts and trying to get them to say, okay, this is, this is the one. And then I think that's when they were going to sign. Right. Now I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. So. Well, the, and the know. scripts are, if you do, if the people listening, if you do uh, download the scripts, they are, they, they are different. Like they're, they're not like, they're not, uh, I found like the when he you know the trailer that came out that everyone got excited about when the that little uh, trailer that they did for the movie the ride like for the movie came mm -hmm. out I'm sure you've seen it probably fifty times <laughs> by yeah. now um, the story the the last script was like I find that you know it like it wasn't do you, do you not find that he was kind of like the trailer was kind of different than what he ended up with at the end. It was kind yeah. of a different, he went in a whole different direction. I'm only, I've read the first script so far. I'm working on the second one. They're big scripts. I gotta be honest. And so do you find that too? Like he was kind of, do you think he was kind of pulling away from that, the trailer and kind of, um, I don't want to say he's, he was watering it down, but do you just think he wanted it in a different direction? He had, uh, consulted with a script writer, um, I guess it was like a professional script writer and she gave him tips on what to do with the script. And I think he followed through with that. Okay. And because the 2014 is what he showed to the mics in okay. California and that's what they decided to go with. Okay. And then they said, well, you're going to have to work on this. They, it was all a rough draft basically. And so that's what he kept going back home and working on and, that's what he literally was working on up until, I guess, November, or October, something like that. Right. So probably on the and, suggestions of them, they were probably saying, you got to change this. You got to kind of work on this mm -hmm. area. So he was just kind of fine tuning it at that point. Correct. Right. And, uh, and you're right. It is, it, it's extremely different. The 2014 scripts are really different from the trailers and I think his audience, I'm sorry, you can't go back there. Come here, come here. I, totally I think know. the audience would have been extremely upset with that right. because that they were expecting certain things to be shown mm -hmm. and he had taken those things out. Right. That's, that's what I try to tell people. Like they're like, well, what was his scripts? Like, I'm like, it's nothing like the trailer. What he ended up with, like, it was it like there was some similarities, but it wasn't like the trailer was a very um, it showed you a very hard line and of where the trailer was going. And then when I read the script, I was like, wow, he was really adding some different things. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so I do find that 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 was very interesting that he was kind of pulling away from that. And I do agree that he would have disappointed a lot of people. I think that even contributed some money to getting 
the project off the ground and stuff like that. I think a lot of groups were, I've said this in one of the, my interviews, that I think that a lot of these groups were looking at David and treating him as the tip of the spear kind of thing for what they believed. And I think that they saw where he went with the trailer and they really went with him. Like they were like, okay, this is, we're going to get to see all the stuff that we talk about. And they kind of used him as the tip of the spear. And I think it's my belief and I could be totally wrong on this. And I've always said, it's my belief. I think that's why he was pulling away from people. And you can even see in his journal where he says that he, he, he uh, unsubscribed from a lot of these groups that he was a part of all these NWO groups. He calls them the new world order yes. groups. So he was kind of distancing himself. I think from those groups, it wasn't just his friends that were a part of that, that he was distancing himself from. He was kind of distancing himself from that whole side of the conspiracy, like that whole area of that uh, topic. And what do you think about mm -hmm. that? Like, do you think he was dis? My question, I guess, is, do you think he was distancing, distancing boy, that's a tongue twister, himself mm -hmm. from those people because he was um, being, like, uh, in a dark place and he was just ignoring them or do you think that he was just trying to pull away from them because of the way his script was going the way he was fine-tuning in that it was kind of in a different direction i think it's a different option from reading his journals he is saying that he has been pressured to the point where he wants to cut ties mm -hmm. they're they're pressuring him uh sean constantly wants a job he wants to be paid for his talent uh danny august mason and, and joseph seaton they're they have all these pipe dream ideas of branching off and making this like some type of a franchise oh, right. kind of thing right, right and he's like i just want to sell my movie i just want to write my script sell my movie and you know get my family away from minnesota he wanted to go to california he talks about that a lot in his journal right and they were i think what they were doing is they were harassing him to the point that they were wearing him down mm -hmm. and he needed to get rid of that dead weight right he's like in the beginning, I, I'm happy to have your help, but now you guys have just annoyed me so much that I have to cut ties with you. Right. And you can see that change where he's happy to see Joseph and to be working out with him. And then I guess something happened and he's just like, he starts talking crap about Joseph in his diary or his journal, and then he won't take his phone calls anymore. Right. And I, but see, I, I totally agree with that, that, that I, that's what I think was pulling him away too, was there was a lot mm -hmm. of um, people pulling on him too. And for whatever reason, like I, but I can also, I put myself in their shoes, like the people that were helping him make this trailer and this movie. And then, and I look at it from their point of view, cause I'm trying to be fair and I want to, I'm trying mm -hmm. to put myself in their situation. And if I was helping David make this movie and I was putting in my time and my effort and my my creativity and all of that and then all of a sudden when there's talks of a deal and then he starts pushing me away for whatever reason he was pushing these people away i don't know the reason he's pushing them away i can see them being upset with him for doing that i mean that's just natural yeah. like so i get where they're coming from too and i also get a lot of people are saying that uh danny august mason who um he wouldn't sign off his rights that he was hanging on to that. And him and David were fighting back and forth about this. And David wanted him to sign his rights in a way. I can't blame Danny for not signing his rights away because he put a lot of work into this with David. So, I mean, he, you know, I can see his point too. I'm being fair. I can see yeah. David's point that he's trying to, you know, do his thing and get his creation. But I can see Danny's point where he's saying, I'm not signing off. I've done, I've acted in this trailer. I've done my, I've done all the work with you. I've re, I've wrote with you. I want to get some of my coming up, come up things too, right? Like, I mean, all of us would. So what, what do you think? Is that a fair assessment? That I, like, I can definitely see why people were upset with David for him cutting them right off like that. But we don't know the reason why. We don't know all the different conversations he had. That's all speculation. Correct. And... Uh, I don't 
blame Danny August Mason for not signing off. Right. I really don't. Right. I don't blame them for being upset with David. What I do have an issue with is selling their friend out in that documentary and in the inter- interviews after he died. Right, right. All to sell a documentary. Right. So yeah. they could still get their money. I have an issue with that. Right, because in that documentary on that was on Netflix, um, they do make it seem like, from what I took, they like when I first saw that documentary, um, it to me I thought they were all really close, right up to the point yeah. he died. Like that's the way that I the documentary came off to me was that they were tight and they were all a group and they were all going forward and working as a team. But then the more you research in the case after you watch the documentaries, when I kind of really started digging in more was that they weren't all getting along. That's not true from what the documentary was showing. And they do, but, you know, granted, in the documentary, they do stay that David was pushing them away and he was he uh, was uh, doing that, but they don't really go into why he was doing that and they kind of make it look like he went into this dark place. And so yeah. it's very, it's a very jarring documentary for me. It just, it just, that's the way it comes off to me. And a lot of the clips that they used, if you look at the clips... In the documentary you'll see a date on there so some of them are from 2012 some of them are from years before the supposed spiral to the dark side and mm-hmm. you know caused them to snap and you're it but it leads people to believe that this is all happening right up until their deaths right and it's it's kind of crappy of well, they're, they're kind of cherry picking, right? That. They're cherry picking things to to fit the story yes. that they're trying to tell. And just like the whole rapture video, if you put your headphones on and you're listening to that in the documentary, you could hear where all the edits took place. Really? So we don't have, yeah, we don't have the entire video. It's over seven minutes long, and they only cherry picked these parts of it to be within the documentary so oh i'm sorry everybody's coming home okay now well that's school. okay if it, if uh, we can do a part two to this how about that that way that that we, sounds great yeah so I, i'll just i'll wrap it up right now and then we'll do a part two when you got time how's that sound that sounds great. All right. Well, thank you. I want to <laughs> thank you, Sophia, so much for taking the time to join me on my podcast yeah. and to talk about this case. And I think it's amazing. And I think that, you know, oh, it's great to discuss it yeah. and to look at all sides of it. So I think that's amazing. And I want to thank you once again for taking the time. And I will definitely have you back on and we'll do a part two and then we can uh, wrap up the whole uh, conversation. How does that sound? That sounds amazing. Thank you, Rick. I really appreciate your time. Oh, I am having, I I totally, uh, you're welcome. And I'm, I'm definitely uh, enjoy discussing this case. I think there's a lot of rabbit holes to go through. And I think that everybody's got to try to keep on the facts and kind of try to avoid the rabbit holes, which I self admit is hard to do, but we're doing our best. (laughs) <laughs> but I will let you go. You go tend to your family, Sophia, and I will definitely get you on and we'll do a part two. Thank you so much. You have a great night. You too. Take care. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye. Well, there we have it, folks. Another episode wrapped up. Another great interview. Kind of cut short, but hey, when family comes along, Family is more important. I can do a part two and we can discuss many more topics about this case. There's still some stuff I want to ask her. And I think that it is uh, a great uh, conversation when we can just sit back and talk. And as I keep saying, I want to try to keep to the facts and look at it both sides uh, of the argument. Because there's definitely, as I keep saying, a side that does think that David definitely did this. And they say the police proved it. And the evidence is there. And the... What I I took everybody's advice because I've heard it from both sides of the argument that if you want to get to the facts and you want to know what you're talking about, go and read all the documents, read the autopsies, read the journal, read, and it's a lot to read. I will I'll warn you ahead of time, it's not like a short little read. It's a lot of stuff to go through. It's a lot of terminology I self-admittedly don't understand, and I really suggest that that's what everybody does in this case if you're new to it 
read the evidence yourself. That is the best way to start with it and read the journals. And, you know, if you're into reading scripts and stuff like that, definitely read a script because those are very interesting too from what I've read so far. And I find them very interesting and gives you kind of an idea of where he wanted to go with the whole gray state, um, like gray state idea. And I think that's, I agree with both sides when they say that we should look into the evidence ourselves and don't trust one person's view on it. Don't trust uh, another person, other people's view on it and what they think happened or didn't happen. Read the evidence yourself. Go through it all and make up your own mind and see where it leads you. And that's what I'm doing so far. And as I said with my interview with Sophia, there's definitely some parts of the case that I'm questioning. And I'm questioning why they didn't do certain things and why they did certain things. And that's just being honest. And I'm trying to be fair. And I will definitely have uh, some people on that that um, say that David is guilty and that the evidence proves it case closed and they believe that that is the truth of it and i definitely want to hear their side i keep saying that i've been speaking with a couple of uh, members from the uh the group that thinks that david is guilty and i do want to apologize in my first interview that i posted with Catherine, i did uh give the last part of my email was wrong i said dot ca instead of dot com totally my mistake it was my first time doing a interview so i just messed up the ending it was nothing intentional and my definitely if you want to get a hold of me it's i say it every video now just email me at bin thinking podcast at gmail.com so bin thinking podcast at gmail.com i've already spoken to a couple of people on the side that believes dave is guilty and I'm going to contact them and definitely set up an interview to hear their side. I think that's only being fair. And I said I will do that. And I am going to do that. And I've said that from day one that I'm going to do that. So I'm definitely going to reach out to them and do that. And get those interviews set up so we can just hear their side, the evidence that they have, and what makes them believe that he's guilty. And I think that's the best way to do it is to, I'm trying to stay in the middle and because I am in the middle. I, I find myself going one way and then going the other. And then I read something else and go that way. And then fl I'm flopping back and forth as I read more and learn more. And it's a lot to learn. And that's why I keep saying read the evidence yourself and make up your own mind after you've read it all. But you have to read it all and especially and try to figure it out before you can just say whether he's guilty or not guilty. I mean, for me, you got to read the evidence. That's all I have to go by. And that's what I'm doing. So... I just want to apologize again. I did not. It was nothing intentional giving out the, the my email at the in my first interview. And also, please don't leave any links in my comment section or uh, emails because I have it set that they won't post. I, I don't want my comment section flooded with links and emails and stuff like that. So I just made it so that nobody can do that I, it's not me deleting messages i have not deleted one message off of any of my comment section so if they're missing it's not by my hand i have not deleted one i've left them all up and i definitely like i said the only ones that would be missing is anything that had an email in it or a link if there's any of those then yes they're going to be removed because i have it set that way and i don't want my comment section just blown up with links so you know if you want to leave a comment go ahead and do so and if you want to email me and you want to talk about it or let me know what you think of the case uh that's cool too i want to hear p uh, both sides so that's where i'm at with that so you got my email and i want to also <laughs> if you want to have a i'm going to interview set up a couple interviews as i keep saying here the other side is i just wanted to make sure that i've read all the evidence of that ca uh, what they're they're you know that they're saying all the evidence i want to make sure that i looked at all the evidence before bringing them on just so I knew that you know I know what I'm talking about I've read the evidence that they're going and they're looking at and that's the evidence that they're referring to I think it's only fair that I know what I'm I read it all and know what I'm kind of talking about and referring to so that's what I'm in the process of doing as I keep saying it's a lot to remember it's a lot to read so I will have them on I'm going to reach out and actually uh, set up a couple see if I can get them on maybe next week 
and hear from them. And I made that clear from my first video uh, that that's what I wanted to do, and that is what I'm going to do. So I'm looking forward to hearing their side of it and see what goes on. Be a great uh, discussion, I think. I enjoy discussing and talking with people. I really do. And as I said at the beginning of my vid uh, this video, I find uh, people's stories very interesting. I always have. I love to hear people's stories. And as I say, kind of like my little thing I like to say, is that everybody has an interesting story. And why is it an interesting story? Because it's your story. That's what makes it interesting. And it's great to have a point of view, and it's great to have a discussion. I think that as long as it's kept within, um, you know, certain parameters and you want to have an open discussion about stuff, there's nothing wrong with that. And I like discussing it and hearing different sides of a story. So that would be great to hear from their side. I'm looking forward to talking to, to uh, setting up a couple interviews and hearing uh, their point of view on the case. And that's where I'm still at. I keep saying I'm stuck in the middle. I really am. And I want to kind of keep try to keep the best I can on that middle path and not try to uh, get influenced anyway. I just want to keep to the evidence and what you can prove and what is fact and stuff like that. I think that's the only proper way that I can go about it for me. And that's the way I want to do it. So I want to thank you all for sticking through. I want to thank Sophia for coming on and uh, talking with us. I will have her on again to uh, finish up this interview. And if you enjoy these interviews, please uh, just consider liking, subscribing, hitting the notification bell. People tell me I should say that. Uh, so please, if you enjoy this, you know, like, subscribe, share this to your friends or people you think might find it interesting. And I think that would be amazing. I'm definitely enjoying this. It's something I'm very, uh, I have a lot of fun doing. And I hope you enjoy coming here and uh, listening to the topics that we talk about. Uh, next week, I will have Paul back. We're going to be going even deeper into cryptocurrency. And uh, we're, like I said, we're just kind of, the last few videos, we're kind of introducing people who don't know much about cryptocurrency, giving them the terminology that they got to know. The last one I just did with him, he speaks about the app that he has that will actually get you involved in actually claiming a little bit of free cryptocurrency. And also on that app has a ton of information on uh, different topics. So if you have any questions for Paul, also email me. I just gave the email. Email me and just leave in the, uh, let me know, you know, in the description that it's for a question for Paul. And I'll make sure I ask him that next week. I look forward to seeing him every week and talking to him because I really enjoy cryptocurrency and learning about it. And so I hopefully you join me for that. I'm going to have some, uh, do some videos talking about uh, music, which is a great big passion of mine. I really enjoy music. It's been a part of my life since I can remember. I've always enjoyed music. So I'm going to be reviewing some albums and talking about albums that made a big difference in my life and ones that influenced me and why they did, my favorite bands. And I hope that's going to be a topic that, you know, if, this kind of stuff with the Crowley case and the more serious topic isn't your cup of bag, you know, your cup of tea, then that's fine. Maybe you'll enjoy the music part of it. We can just sit back and talk about music. Love to hear your uh, points about music and the music you love and why you love it. I think that'd be a great topic. So trying to do a little bit for everybody and cover the topics I find interesting. So I hope you join me for that. That's going to be something that I start doing very soon. So I want to thank you all once again for coming to the crypt, sitting back with me and having a discussion and have a great day, great evening, depends where you're from. And I'm definitely looking forward to uh, doing another interview and having you all join me again. Have a great day, guys. Take care and I will see you soon.